everybody. I'm Matt. Uh, this is about FUIT, or F-U-I-T, if you'd rather call it that, a corporate IT survival guide. I'm Matt Cash. One second, that's all right. I'm currently uh, an IT manager for a Michigan-based uh, natural gas distribution utility. I have a staff of about 13 that works for me. Um, it's uh, not very exciting. It doesn't sound very sexy, does it? So uh, compared to some of the titles I've heard around here, like Kahuna and some other things. But uh, um, that is what it is. Uh, I have about 24 years of um, tech experience. I've done everything from desktop to network to network administration. Yeah, who cares about that? Um, uh, just, just about everything, uh, Unix administration. I'm a big BSD guy, I love BSD, although I'm not presenting with it. I probably should have, uh, just to prove it. Um, I am an, a real IT guy. I'm not a vendor. I'm not uh, a consultant. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, I'm not pushing anything. I'm not trying to sell anything. Uh, this is really more of a, a, a pitch to the IT person and really a wake-up call to our industry um, about the challenges that consumerization is, is kind of posing to us. I've been a Citrix admin since uh, MetaFrame 1.8. It's about 1999, I think, NT4, Terminal Server Edition. If you uh, go back that far, um, kind of the small print, uh, my opinions are my own. Uh, I'm not really here speaking for anybody. I'm not speaking for my company. I'm not speaking for, I don't know, Anybody in this room, uh, those responsible have been sacked. The survival of IT. Um, this is, you know, really, this is not me being melodramatic or glib. Uh, IT is really kind of faced with probably one of the biggest challenges it's faced probably since the early 80s when the PC really broke, um, kind of challenging that whole convention of the mainframe. Uh, this is the continuation of life or existence. So um, this is pretty serious stuff for IT people. And a lot of departments, including my own, haven't really seen the impact, the full impact of what's out there, but it's coming, and they need to prepare for it. Uh, FUIT, kind of uh, a brief history. I, I think uh, Brian's overused the Latin thing forever, so I actually translated it. I wanted it to be an acronym, so, you know, FUDUO, Vos, Informatio, Technology, how about that? Um, my kind of history with FUIT uh, started last year. Uh, Brian wrote an article on his blog entitled The Consumer the Consumerization of IT. Um, that kind of launched uh, the whole consumerization discussion, at least is for, in my mind. Uh, he got that going in, in my head. And the whole concept of FUIT, you know, kind of this user revolt against their IT department. Um, that kind of started that way. And my first take on it was it, it really uh, kind of pissed me off. <laughs> um, I was really mad that, you know, who are these users think they are? They're ignoring policy. They're bringing in devices that we don't approve of. They're storing data in places that the company doesn't want it stored. I mean, this was really kind of a, a Kubler-Ross, you know, five stages of grief type of thing. You know, I'm in denial. I'm kind of denying that this is really happening when it really is, you know, and then I kind of get down those steps and I'm angry and then at the end I'm kind of, I'm accepting it. There's, uh, there's some truth to what uh, FUIT brings to uh, the organization, so. Uh, what put the FU in FUIT? Um, what irritates users? Well, not having any choices is really, really big. Um, Endpoint, they get stuck with a seven-year-old corporate PC that's you know, outperformed by a $350 throwaway PC. They get at Staples. Um, that makes them mad uh, that you know, they got more power at their house on their own computer than they do at the computer at work. <coughs> uh, choices as far as uh, software. You, know, you want to track your sales leads but uh, IT provides you with this green screen emulation app from a COBOL app written in the 90s that that's where you're supposed to track your sales leads. You know, foo it, I'm going out and I'm getting salesforce.com and you know, the hell with this, I'm gonna track my own stuff with better software than you can provide me. 
Um, the internet performance and content filtering, this is a, a real touch point with a lot of users. You know, you want to go to YouTube, you want to go to Twitter, Facebook. Well, guess what? It's not approved. You know, your WebSense or your, um, your other content filter is blocking this. You know, foo it, I'm bringing in my own MiFi and I'm not dealing with this content filter stuff anymore. I'm just going to go to the internet the way I want to go to it. Um, true story, I was sitting in our uh, call center area at our utility and I was monitoring some stuff that was going on there for application performance, completely unrelated. A new employee had just started, sat down in her cube and started typing away and got on her net browser, immediately went to facebook.com which is against our core policy, uh, at least for those class of users. And she saw the block page, she looked over at, her, at the older employee who had been there for a while and said, hey, what's, what's up with this? And she says, oh, we blocked Facebook here. Oh, okay. She reaches into her purse, pulls out her smartphone, fires up her Facebook app. You know, that was really effective. And then there's the whole, you know, concept of excessive and dated policy restrictions. Um, would you like to uh, map a new printer uh, on your PC? Well, guess what? You don't have any rights. You can't install a driver. So you gotta call IT. When they get around to it, they'll install it. Or I just bought a printer, and now I want it to work. You know, and I took the PC home, and I, I want to print to my home printer. I can't do that either. You know, the hell with that. I'm just gonna bring in my own PC. I'm gonna P-card my own printer, and I'm done. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, you want to share a file with someone in your ad hoc team? I mean, do you have to submit a help desk ticket to do that? You have to get IT to, you know, change permissions or put you in different groups and then, oh wait, you know, the person I want to share with doesn't even work here. Oh well, you know, that's a whole convoluted process and you're going to make the employee go through that and what they end up saying is, foo it, you know, I'm going to Dropbox and I'm going to share with whoever I want and I don't need IT for any of this stuff. <clears throat> email, the file you wanted to email, and it bounced back because, you know, IT had a 5 meg attachment restriction on your Exchange mailbox, and now you want to store email for a few years. Uh, sorry, we delete that every 90 days, no matter what. Oh, and uh, you got a 250 meg mailbox restriction, so, you know, deal with that. Well, foo it, I'm just going to use Gmail. Oops, sorry to jump. You need to access work stuff from home? Um, well, install this really old buggy IPsec VPN client on your home PC and then pray that it doesn't destroy something on your machine, keep it from working or connecting to the internet anymore. You know, you know I heard about this thing, it's called uh, go to my PC, why can't I just install that? and get to my work stuff that way. What do I have to deal with all this VPN stuff? And there's Nick Burns for everybody. Um, what irritates IT? Uh, users. No, I'm just kidding. Users, users irritate us. Uh, users are their own worst enemy, right? Yeah, they have no concept of the threats that they are incurring against their company by, you know, kind of this wanton behavior of just going out and doing whatever they want, bringing in a PC that, you know, IT is not blessed or has the right security controls on or is not encrypted, you know, whatever it is. And ignorance is blessed to the user, right? Hey, all this stuff works. I don't care. You know, you got a policy. I don't read it. You know, this is what drives IT people crazy. You know, I want to drop an unencrypted sensitive file in Dropbox. What are you going to do about it? You won't even know about it. You probably don't even know I'm doing it. And then you got this whole BYOD trend where you got um, people wanting to bring in, have the company provide a stipend or uh, allow them to bring their own device into work. Well, now you got IT people, now they have to support a platform, probably a lot of them uh, haven't had a support before, like a Mac or an iPad or an iPhone, um, they have this whole, you know, I gotta learn a new platform now because, you know, this joker wants to bring in something new. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Jurassic Park, kind of the Jeff Goldblum character, 
and he says, uh, <laughs> he says, uh, you wield your newfound freedom like a kid that's found his dad's gun. I mean, that's, that's really, that's what we're talking about. I mean, it's, it's kind of, they have this freedom, but they don't know what to do with it. They're not sure what's going on. Here's my expert analysis from the two-bullet slide. Uh, users are wrong. <laughs> um, but I would uh, posit that this is a lot less than IT thinks they are. You know, security and integrity of corporate data isn't a joke. Um, there's real ramifications, there's real regulations, there's real consequences when users, you know, breach data, you know, lose their laptop, drop their iPhone in a place they shouldn't have dropped it, and, you know, there is some accountability on their side. But I would really say that's kind of where it ends. Um, and IT is wrong. Okay, they're misguided. <laughs> Uh, the best practices from the past are stifling and have stifled in the past uh, this whole productivity and innovation of the employee. If the employee has a better way of doing their job, we shouldn't be a roadblock. We shouldn't get in the way. We should be helping them. How does IT shoot itself in the foot? Well, you know, the stark reality is, is that IT in a lot of organizations is getting completely left out of this conversation. They're not being brought to the table as far as, you know, somebody wants Salesforce, well, we don't need IT for that, so we're not going to bring them into a meeting. And, you know, they just get in the way anyway. So, you know, IT is too slow, they're too expensive, they just say no to everything that we ask them. So now you've got a whole rack of, of hardware vendors, and service providers that don't even sell to IT, don't even sell to enterprise. They're going right to the person that uses the application. Nothing else is getting in the way. And, you know, an iPad is not really designed to be in an enterprise environment. I mean, you have schools deploying these things like crazy. You have companies, you know, execs bringing them in. You got users bringing them in. There's no enterprise thought to these devices. I mean, it's, it's an afterthought if it's there, but, you know, the whole concept of app stores and, and all these things aren't really conducive to the enterprise. So you have to, you know, bolt on an MDM solution or an MAM solution in order to have any kind of control on it. But, you know, these vendors don't care what the impact is. <clears throat> so, basically, you got users doing this end around uh, IT, um, because they have these archaic uh, policies um, that are still out there. Uh, there was an article in Forbes written by Adam Hartung where he talks about the best practices myth. And as a tool, um, it's being used to stop productivity improvement and adoption of tech new, new technology, um, specifically how to control how employees access information, how to keep uh, employees focused on their job without any kind of distractions. You know, they don't want their people all sitting around with iPads playing Angry Birds all day. Um, they don't want to have a, an inconsistency in their tool set. And probably the biggest thing that I see is, you know, we made this big investment in Windows desktops, in VDI, whatever it is, you know, this huge ERP application. And, you know, we got to maximize that investment. Everybody's going out 100 different directions. We're not getting any, any uh, juice for the squeeze. So this really reminds me of the mainframe versus the PC. When I started with the utility 24 plus years ago, um, everything ran on a mid-range IBM AS400. And I mean, it was actually a System 38 at the time, if you can go back that far. And they showed up with 20 PCs, it was only 20, not network, not anything, they just dropped them on people's desks because you just wanted them so bad. And they're like, well, how do we use these things? We don't know what to do with these things. We have this expensive mainframe, and it's running all this stuff. It's got every app that users should run. And they decided, well, we'll give them PCs to shut them up. So what do they do? They put terminal emulation cards in the PC, and the PC basically became a glorified green screen that could run like Lotus 1, 2, 3 or something. But this whole mindset is just replaying out again. This is a mainframe versus PC type of thing, where you've got kind of your entrenched bureaucracy, which is your current IT, 
and you know, your, your upstart pissing at kids, as Brian would call them, that, that come in and challenge all this convention. They don't, they're like the PC people were in the early 80s. You know, why do I have to use your ERP system, you know, or going back to the mainframe, why do I have to use your COBOL green screen program when I can use Lotus 1, 2, 3 and you know, calculate a depreciation in half the time? That's the kind of thing that uh, users are, are experiencing. Um, there was a study of ERP systems by IFS Corporation last year, and they said that 75% of the ERP users use cloud-based apps or spreadsheets to manage their business. They don't use the ERP to do that. They have their own Excel spreadsheet. They've got something they're paying in the, in the cloud that doesn't, you know, you got this big expensive SAP system, but they're using something else to get critical work done, and all that critical work is actually not in the ERP at all. That's three quarters of the users of these systems. Same survey said that at least one third of the people at these companies that use these ERP systems wanted to quit or change their job because the technology at their company was too difficult for them to use. And if they were under 40, then it jumped up to two thirds. So you got a whole generation of people that are just like, you know, I can't take this, I'm leaving. So job retention becomes a big problem. 41% of enterprises don't allow, this one blew me away, don't allow employee-owned Macs to access corporate systems at all. 32% don't allow employee-owned Windows PCs access. I don't know why there's a disparity that they're picking on Macs, but they are. But even the 32% at the low end is shocking in that they can't even access email. I mean, like, these people have never heard of, like, Outlook Web Access or something. They can't even access email from the outside. I heard a rumor that Tech Target used to require VPN access to, to view email. Is that still valid? Yes, it is. So they would be in that 32%. <clears throat> the whole concept is, is to embrace FUIT, and this is a difficult thing for a lot of IT people. Um, they think they can fight it. And this goes back to kind of the five stages, right? We have this whole uh, anger and I want to battle this. When I bring this stuff up, and I'll even, I've used like food articles in my staff meetings, and their first gut reaction is, they, how do we control this? How do we stop it? Instead of worrying about how to stop it, we should be worried about why are they doing it in the first place? This whole concept of fighting consumerization is a lost cause. It really, it's over. I mean, the war is over. They just don't know it. The war is over. You know, consumer platforms are going to dominate. The growth of these systems are just exponential. You know, Android had um, just 100, they had over 100 million activations just in May of 2011. They had 100 million. And then over a year later, now there's 400 million Android activations. So, you know, a fourfold increase in one year. And then you've got Apple, who sold to date last quarter 365 million iOS powered devices. 365 million. What is there, like five or 600 million corporate desktops? And there's already that many iOS devices out there. In quarter two of 2012, Apple sold 35 million iPhones and 11 million iPads. Um, in every public education uh, school, K-12 system in the United States, there's, a, there's an iPad pilot going on. Uh, there are school districts in Michigan, where I live, that have one-to-one -one initiatives, and you, you probably know about these in your states, too. But they want every student to have an iPad. An iPad is becoming the new textbook. That's what all the schoolwork gets done in. That's where all their textbooks are. It's, you know, where their planner is. It's all happening. So now you got this whole generation of kids that's going to come out in the next three or four years. They don't have any concept of using a Windows PC. I just used an iPad. Why am I having to use this, this to do my work? Dropbox currently has over 50 million users, and that, that was double from a year ago. Salesforce.com has 2.1 million subscribers. I didn't know there was that many salesmen out there, but apparently there is. Let 
what is a corporate IT department to do? Well, um, like I said, the, 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 you know, the cards are stacked against you. You have to embrace consumerization. You have to really go back and look at what you're doing. You know, Emerson says, this is my favorite Emerson quote of all time, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. If you keep doing things the same way just because that's the way you've always done them, that's not going to produce any kind of innovation or productivity out of your user base. You, know, you need to relax the restrictions. You need to change your IT department's focus to securing data first. That's really the most important thing. And the other stuff is kind of secondary, it's still important, but secondary to that mission. Um, the department of no is dead. You know, it really need to leave it in the 90s where it belongs. You know, today's workers that work any place, any time, on any device, you know, IT can bend significantly uh, and not, you know, lose their mission of being a steward of, uh, of user data and technology. In the process, they become more valuable to, to their customers. Um, you're not going to be out of a job because you let somebody have a larger exchange mailbox. You're not going to be out of a job because you let somebody bring a Mac to work. Um, you have to really just keep asking why IT is still doing some of the things they're doing. If you can't keep people from going to social media, for example, I mean, let's face it, you can't. They're going to get there whether you want it or not. You know, you're better off taking the tack of going to your company and saying, hey, let's set a realistic policy. I hate that word. But you say a policy with the company and say, hey, we're going to allow social media, but you know, here's some constraint. You know, we have to have something out there. But you know, IT is, is constantly in this, this role of being the cop, being the enforcer. We're not good at that. And we try to secure a lot of things to the endpoint. We'll talk about that in a second. But because we do that, you know, we're kind of the fall guy with the users. And that's what kind of the FU and the FUIT comes from. IT is not the HR department. We're not the executive wing of the company. Um, you know, you need to provide input to those departments. But, you know, IT needs to get out of that role. Another strategy is to champion technology. Um, start by piloting uh, company-wide. You know, just start doing stuff that, that consumers want, users want. You know, dog food your own department. You know, if you work for an IT department and p users are wanting to use Dropbox or SkyDrive, have your guys and girls and gals use that, that tool and give you feedback. Go to another department where, you know, they're crying out to do that. You know, and responsibly sit down with them and say, here's some of the risks, this is what we do, and, and, and monitor it. You can't just, you know, have this default of allowed deny, on, off. I mean, that's, a lot of the IT departments make that mistake. They, they don't have a gray area. There's no bend. It's all or nothing. You know, you can use a PC or I can tell you to take your Mac home. And I don't want, I don't want to ever see it again. Um, you know, what if somebody in your company switches off of um, the local installed Microsoft Office and starts using Google Docs or Office 365, whatever you want, you know, whatever the user wants. Um, you know, you can get a lot of valuable feedback from doing stuff like that. And really, I think the most important thing, sorry, is to stop dictating and start listening to your users. Um, I think that's IT's biggest problem is that they try to tell users how to do their job. And, you know, users are tired of it, and now they have a way around it. So this is the new dynamic. Let's talk about mitigation. Um, kind of the relaxing this whole control over the endpoint thing. Um, you know, there's lots of options out there, most of which uh, you're probably familiar with, but you may not be. RDSH, a terminal server, you know, and I love the, the Citrix name for this now. I was actually reading this the other day. Zen Desktop Hosted Shared Desktop. What is that? I mean, that's crazy. You can't make shit up like that. I just, um, this is probably a, a good solution for a lot of use cases, um, particularly when it comes to BOD. You know, you got a PC that's kind of the users, right? And they want to access corporate data. They want to access corporate apps. You know, it's a perfect 
apps and data are in the data center, their stuff's on their PC. Um, and uh, most of you probably already know it's multi-platform uh, to some degree. You know, if you're on an iPad, the experience is not very good. But, I mean, it is out there as an option. Uh, I would say the cons uh, of RDSH are, you know, some apps don't work. They just plain don't work or install in that environment. They weren't designed for it. Um, and the VDI fanboys uh, will tell you that, you know, you need a VDI for, like, app compatibility. But a lot of apps will work with some work in, in these platforms, I think. And you can make an RDSH uh, desktop look just like a Windows 7 desktop. I mean, it's, there's a really good session last year, Spry Forum, that talked about that very topic. Type 1 hypervisors, kind of the, the bare metal options. Um, Citrix just absorbed virtual computer. You know, Zen Client and XTOP. Uh, Mocha 5 has a bare metal hypervisor too now, uh, you know, a desktop hypervisor. Um, the biggest problem with this option is that it's destructive. You know, if you want a BYOD and you want the user to bring their own uh, a Windows PC in, it, first thing you have to do is format it and install these, uh, this Type 1 hypervisor. And that's kind of a non-starter for a lot of users. They don't want you messing with any of that stuff. Uh, the HCL, you know, the whole hardware compatibility list is, is a real problem with these things. It doesn't run on everything. Every peripheral isn't recognized. Uh, I, I, got, I got a Dell, it's about a three-year-old Dell U6500, but I have an NVIDIA video card in it. You know, some client won't even start. So it, it was kind of a non-starter. NX Top did work. It wasn't as fast as Zen Client, though. I mean, there's trade-offs in, in these environments. Type 2 hypervisors, I'm sure uh, most of you have seen uh, VMware Workstation on PCs or, v, you know, Fusion on, on Macs. Uh, VirtualBox, uh, which is Oracle's product, is actually pretty decent. It's open source. It runs on everything. You can run it on BSD, Linux, Windows, Mac. Um, Virtual PC, which is becoming Hyper-V inside of Windows 8. Um, not good for, you know, if you don't have a Mac. Uh, if you have a Mac, you're not going to be able to run MS uh, Virtual PC. Uh, Parallels is another popular uh, option for Type 2 virtualization. Um, Mocha 5 is kind of a Type 2 thing where, you know, they, they bubble everything inside of this image and then they encrypt it and, and you can install, your, you know, your apps and, and, and push it out to your users. But the big thing here is the option for Type 2 is to kind of put your corporate image either on the base uh, host operating system or in the Type 2 hypervisor itself. So now you have this PC that is used for just the corporate work. It's not used for their personal stuff. So there's some logical separation there. I mean, security is not perfect, but uh, it is an option. Uh, I mean, the pros are it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, user gets a personal desktop, IT gets a lockdown managed desktop, it's, and it's not destructive. Um, the cons are it's difficult to manage at a large scale. And then uh, probably the single most underused option in Windows 7 I've ever seen is this one, boot from VHD. Uh, this is kind of an old school thing. Uh, some of us can remember actually dual booting PCs, but you can actually boot from a VHD file, a virtual hard disk file, in Windows 7. So one option is you could build a corporate VHD, give it to the user, and they have a Windows PC, they can boot off of that, and they actually have a corporate machine when they're using that VHD, and when they, they exit it, and they can boot their own. It's kind of clunky, but it does work, and it's basically included with the operating system. Desktop virtualization, which is obviously a big focus of this conference. You know, you have Citrix on desktop, VMware View, uh, Quest. Um, I mean, these are more like having a real desktop PC. Um, I'd say the, the pros are you, you're really getting, you know, a platform-neutral uh, client that you can access from anywhere. 
and that you know it's, it's a real Windows 7 session if that's what you're pushing out. Uh, cons are it's extremely expensive. Um, you know, if you don't have SA, you know, the whole VDA uh, license hell is is a lot. You know, you're looking at three to four times the cost of like a terminal server to push out a, a VDI desktop. And there's a huge infrastructure investment. Yeah, I got to have shared storage. Um, I got to have third-party apps to make all this stuff work. Um, it's extremely complex. And you likely, a lot of you probably don't have VDI in production or just in a pilot stage, so you're going to have to build all this out. So it's not going to be ready right away. So that's a big consideration, too. Other considerations are, are layering, kind of these layering technologies. Um, Unidesk, I know, is one. Um, I think RingCube, which Citrix absorbed, was another. Um, <clears throat> basically, just allows people to install applications inside of VDI, and those are retained, you know, image to image. So when they boot the machine next time, they get all their stuff. But you have this gold image sitting down at the bottom that that you know IT is maintaining, and then the user maintains their own apps in their own session. The um, there are some other options out there that are no cost. Um, there's a guy named uh, Matt Diglio. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He works at uh, Scottsdale Community College. Uh, he wrote a Citrix streaming profiler, uh, PowerShell script, that actually uh, allows the user to uh, submit the installer for the program. It profiles it using the Citrix profiler, and it publishes, it publishes the whole thing as an application, and you can click on it and launch it. So like in a web interface, when they log in, they can actually see the app they just installed. Um, I'm going to do a demo here. Oh, sorry, my PowerPoint foo is not very good, so i got to exit PowerPoint. This is a piece of software that AppSense has in their labs. It's called uh, Strata Apps. It's a nice little concept. I mean, it's still very, I think, early uh, product for them, or a concept product. But uh, one of the things it allows you to do is once you have Strata Apps installed on, on the PC, the user can install their own applications and not actually impact the workstation at all. So with Strata Apps running, I can actually take out an app like 7-Zip, which is what I have here. Oops. And it's going to install 7-Zip. It's a pretty easy concept for the user to, to do, too. And what it's doing is it's actually writing I'll just run through the install. It's running to the C drive, uh, kind of the differences in the disk that this application is making. So now we have 7-zip installed in the framework of this Strata app. So I can actually launch 7-zip and it's running. You'll notice kind of the lime green border around it. That's a Strata app that's, that's running. Some of the downsides of this product are similar to AppV or um, Citrix Profiler in that you can't, um, like if I want to, to zip something by right clicking and getting the shell extension, I do not get the 7 zip shell extensions because they're not recognized. But it is an option that you can push out to the user to allow them some flexibility on their own workstation. Bring on device. Um, 
There's a good technology survey out right now that finds that 50% of the employees starting in a company expect to have the business support bringing in their own device, their own mobile device. That's half. Half the employees think they're gonna bring their own technology into work by 2013. Um, businesses really need to define a BYOD strategy if they haven't done it. I mean, you should be talking, if you're in corporate IT, you should be talking to your C-level people about BYOD, and they need to come up with a policy for what they're gonna do. I mean, they, and they probably don't know what to do because it's very early and there's a lot of legal ramifications. There was a great bright forum presentation on this last year, uh, Claudio did um, on BYOD, and I think uh, the one in London actually had a lawyer come in uh, in 2011. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to think about when you think about rolling out BYOD. But you can pilot this and get some useful feedback. And you might, you know, you had the whole concept of, of opting in, putting these things out to users that actually want to do it. And you don't have to force this on people that don't want to do it. But if you give them the option, I mean, that's, that's a good um, hedge against uh, FUIT. And then really divine uh, your whole device life cycle. And a lot of companies have really good life cycle planning, and I've been to other companies where they don't. I mean, you have people using extremely old PCs, or they're buying the bottom level corporate desktop. I mean, you're competing against, you know, Staples. You're competing against Dell. You're competing against Apple devices. I mean, if you have something that, that's very slow, I mean, a user's just gonna reject it. I mean, they know they can buy better, and they know how much it costs. The whole concept of controlling and dictating endpoints. Um, this was a really good comment. On, it was on a, actually on an article I think that Brian wrote. And if you're here, I won't try to butcher your name. Uh, please raise your hand because I wouldn't mind talking to you. Um, really good comment. You have to start thinking of an IT environment without endpoint management at all. I mean, users are going to bring in what they're going to bring in. They're going to make that decision. IT is not going to drive that anymore. Um, the whole capability to dictate to dictate the endpoint, not even manage it, is lost. Now, unless you're gonna put your employees inside of one of these, which is a Faraday cage, to keep them from using the air as a network. And um, David Stafford had a really good session on FUIT uh, just a little while ago. Uh, you know, they use power line ethernet adapters to get around network restrictions at work. So they actually bypassed you know, they linked networks that aren't even supposed to be bridged together uh, totally outside of their IT. You don't want to push people to that kind of behavior. And you know, unless the company is going to like pat people down, see if they have an iPhone, they brought on their own PC, it, it's not going to work. The, uh, the whole thing about file sharing, you know, Dropbox is this huge uh, two-ton gorilla in the space. Um, it's drop dead simple to use. Uh, you want to share a file, you know, you send a link, you want to sync a, a file up to the box, you just drop it in the folder. I mean, it's, there's, you would not find a, a product that has an easier interface than that. And there's lots of competition. You know, SkyDrive, which I use, is great too. Um, share link, or share file, excuse me, SugarSync, all these things are out there. Um, enterprise friendly services are starting to gel in this space. And share files a lot, probably built more for the enterprise in terms of, you know, the data is encrypted at rest and in flight, which, you know, is really important to a company that, that's worried about storing its uh, data out in the cloud. Um, let's see. Windows 8 and uh, Office 2013, Office 365, uh, the new version, which they're already previewing. These all have, like, built-in links to SkyDrive. So like out of the box, these things already use cloud storage, the operating system and the application. Now the whole um, concept of security, this is really the IT pain point, I would say, and this is really why IT people freak out. The whole file encryption um, argument is, you know, you gotta get your users to encrypt files. Um, there's lots of ways to do it, and people don't even use the ones that are freely available to them. In Office, you can encrypt AES-256 just by using 
password protection and using one of the, like DOCX or XLSX, the open formats, the open XML formats. Um, that's one way. And then GPO, you can actually go and enforce like a password complexity. So that'd be one way to allow people to store these files in the cloud and put a decent password on it in case the thing is, is breached. You know, compression utilities like 7-Zip, which I was just showing you, have encryption capabilities too. I mean, you can t check a flag and set a ES-256 on them. Um, another really cool utility is um, Boxcryptor. If you uh, have never seen that, I'll, I'll show that to you right now. Box scripter um, basically ends up storing or mapping a drive. I'm sorry, this machine is running really, really slow. There it is. You can see that it's running as an S drive, which I just call the S for secure. That folder is, actually lives in Dropbox. Uh, it could live in SkyDrive, it could live in any file sharing thing. It doesn't even have to live in a, file, a cloud uh, file sharing uh, solution. But what it will do is anything you drop in that drive, it will encrypt. So everything in S is encrypted. So if I just add a file, I'll just add this PDF. I mean, that's a pretty simple concept for a user. I just dropped it in this thing. Now, what does it look like to anybody else? If I go into Dropbox, actually, I'm dropping all my box scripter uh, files in this folder. It even encrypts the file names, which is really nice. A lot of people overlook that part because, you know, if somebody, a prospective attacker, is wanting to look at what's inside a file, you know, if he gets a really good clue on what the name of the file is, he's probably going to concentrate on that one, not another one. Yes, they have Mac clients, Linux clients, Windows clients. Um, they have a native Dropbox app in the App Store. I'm not sure about Android. I think they, they do have an Android one too. And then you can access it just like you do, you know, Dropbox. Um, it's just that's set up. Very easy for the user to use. Easy concept. Another one is Data Locker. How am I doing on time? I'm sorry. Here's another one called Data Locker, which is another AppSense Lab item. Not as simple to use, but uh, we'll do the same thing. I'll just drag and drop the file that I want to encrypt. I ask where it wants to go. I'll put it in my, in my Dropbox under Data Locker. The file's now an encrypted file. It's got an ALK extension. And decrypting is basically just the opposite. And the nice thing about Boxcryptor versus this utility is there's you know one password that the user sets initially. 
you know, as long as they're logged into their PC securely, it's open, it, it works. So it's pretty seamless for them. This requires a, a little bit more work. It's more like encrypting the files manually, like in Office. There's some upsides for IT, believe it or not. Um, surprise. <laughs> uh, IT doesn't have to be the traffic cop anymore. We don't have to tell users, well, you can share with this person, but you can't share with that person because our permissions aren't laid out that way. You know, users ad hoc their own stuff. Um, you know, and that often transcends the company barriers. You know, departmental barriers, site barriers. They might be doing a project with a, a contractor or a consultant, that kind of thing. Um, most of these utilities, backup and version stuff. I mean, they, they automatically back up just because of the nature of the way they work. But they also, a lot of them version as well. So they could go back and see the version they, they saved an hour ago, for example. Um, so that's kind of a self-service restore for the user. Uh, and the biggest thing that I like out of the whole thing is, you know, you don't have to make your exchange server like the file server for the users, which is kind of how they use it right now. Internet access. Uh, whole concept of content filtering. Um, you recall the, the Facebook example I gave earlier. Um, IT somehow is the internet police. I, I don't know how this ever happened, but we, we became the fall guy for how you get to the internet. You know, why does IT decide where a company's employee goes, when, how often, where, uh, how they use the internet? Um, you know, implement a self-service override uh, to get approval on some of these more suspect areas that your company is a little nervous about letting them get to. Um, this is a screen actually from uh, my environment where we allow uh, self-service. This is uh, using Microsoft Threat Management Gateway. It has a built-in content filter. Um, other products have similar capabilities, but a lot of businesses don't use them. And what you can do with this is you kind of get out of this role that I don't say you can't go there. You say whether you go there or not, and if you do, you know, and your boss doesn't like you going to the site all the time, well, that's really not my problem. It's your boss's problem with you. So it gets us out of this, this whole circle. And I don't know if anybody can see what site that is, but for whatever reason, uh, appvertguru.com got access as social opinion. So if anybody goes to that site, I thought that was kind of funny. The whole internet performance issues of, of bandwidth uh, Wi-Fi availability, uh, you know, somebody's upset because somebody's using a MiFi in the office, but, you know, if your branch office that this user is in only has a T1 internet connection, you know, can you blame them? You know, if I can get a 10 to 12 megabit uh, connection off of 4G LTE MiFi, you know, why would I pick the crappy office connection? I mean, there's no competition. You know, a business cable um, connection in Michigan, you know, 22 meg down, is less than 100 bucks a month. And most businesses, that's not a huge cost. And if you provide a, a method for them to get to that network and to get out to the internet, I mean, they're probably gonna use that rather than, you know, fork over their own money or go through the expense process of getting their own MiFi. Um, it's really kind of a no-brainer too. Uh, you can add internet caching. A lot of companies don't even do this. I, I don't know why, but you know, you could save 30 to 40% of your bandwidth right off the bat just by caching it you know, with something like Squid or you know, any number of, uh, of utilities to get that done. Um, the whole concept of Wi-Fi, you know, everybody wants to bring in their device uh, that has Wi-Fi capability. A lot of businesses don't have guest networks or uh, the ability to onboard these devices. Um, and we'll talk about this in a second, but you know, really you need to design your network to allow just about any device to come in to the corporation, to come into the office and be used. On email, um, you really need to think about relaxing quotas if you have really, really strict ones. I think Gmail's up to like 10 gig now for a mailbox. Um, and the other thing is just, you know, the whole attachment thing, and Gmail allows 25 meg, and if you're allowing five, you know, you're providing more resistance to using your product. 
the, you know, the whole thing here is if you can't really compete with something like Gmail and keep the cost down and you, you know, maybe you ought to think about going to Gmail. Maybe you ought to think about going to a different service or a hosted service to do it. If you can't compete, then you have to kind of capitulate those things. Mail archiving, you know, this whole concept of, of users, you know, I deleted my email and IT, you know, IT deletes them after 90 days because that's their corporate policy. Um, you know, users have been rolling their own PST files for a long time now. A lot of them know how to do it, and anybody that can go to Google can archive their own mail. Um, I would prefer that I had control over that, and there's a lot of solutions out there for mail archiving. Exchange has built in mail archiving, um, not very good. GFI Mail Archiver is a really good product too. Um, these are really good ways of getting users to stop using, you know, their own private PST collection of, of archiving things. And it's kind of, and you make it web accessible and really easy to use and, and you kind of keep them on the corporate space. And this, allow access from anywhere. Um, if you're not doing this now, I mean, you really need to look at it. You know, I was floored that 32% at the base don't allow anybody to access corporate email. Corporate email, I mean, from any non-company owned device. You know, no wonder Gmail has so many users with policies like that. You know, MDM can help some, and I, I really liked uh, John from uh, Mocha 5 talked about, you know, one of these, uh, these concepts of, you know, MDM is users don't really want that control of their device. I mean, that's kind of like why they're on it in the first place, because they don't like you looking at it. That's why they brought their own. But, I mean, that's, that's another thing to get hashed out. But, you know, anybody can stand up an OWA site if you have uh, Exchange. And anybody can publish, you know, in remote app or, or in Citrix or whatever solution you're using, a published Outlook application that users can get to securely from anywhere. Passwords. Um, this is a, a big pain point with users. This is not so much a consumerized IT thing, but it's just something that drives users crazy. And it drives them to, you know, write their stuff down on a Post-it note, um, complain to your, um, to like C-level people that, hey, this password's too hard, I have to change it all the time, it has to be really strong, complex. And you'd be surprised that, you know, a lot of, a lot of times uh, management will back down, they'll let the user have that, and then now you're stuck with a really weak password that doesn't change as often as you want. Um, personally, I think you get better security from a strong password uh, that doesn't change very often, because the user doesn't write it down, it could be as long as a year, but if you get them to use a really strong password, that's a lot better than having a really weak password that changes every 60 days. Um, in AD, uh, under 2008 uh, domain level, I think uh, they allow for multiple password policies now. So you can actually set up different policies for different people. So you got probably a class of users uh, that has very low access in terms of what data they can get to, and they might just be checking email, um, they might just be using like one small corporate app that doesn't have a lot of sensitivity to it. You know, why make those people change their password every 60 days? Uh, you know, have a policy that reflects what they have authority to. And kind of reduce the quantity of passwords. You have this whole um, uh, thing where you, you have, you know, a bunch of apps, they have different uh, password requirements, and it, you're forcing the user to write a lot of this down. And Instead of using like a password manager, uh, Citrix has one. Um, I mean, Forefront Identity Manager is another one. But you know, implementing an SSO would help. There's even some really low-tech ways of doing this too. I'll show you one really quick. This is uh, one called Password Safe. It's open source, doesn't cost a dime. Instead of having the user put it on a post-it note, show them this. They can actually store all their passwords in here securely, and it's encrypted, and even better, if they're using Dropbox or SkyDrive or whatever, they can actually replicate this to the cloud. It's secure because it's an encrypted file, and they can access those passwords from anywhere, provided they have access to Password Safe which is not a difficult uh, app to install at all. It also has some
really um, primitive uh, capabilities as far as autotyping. Whoops. So if I got a, they have something that they have to remember the login to, you can actually train password safe to, to remember that for them. I mean, this is just a, an easy, consumer friendly way of doing stuff like this. Um, there's sensitive areas, obviously, that, that, that are going to need a lot better. And if you don't have two or three factor authentication, and, and um, I mean, you really need to start looking at those too. If you can get two factor authentication that doesn't require a password at all, you know, it's a, a secure ID card and, and um, you know, some kind of proximity thing or a fingerprint, I mean, that's better. I mean, they don't expire, the user doesn't have to remember them. It's just one less thing for them to have to screw around with. And really, kind of what to focus on, you know, we talk about securing the data. And then I would say, then the app, then the client, which is probably the inverse of the way most IT departments work. They want to secure the endpoint first, then maybe the app, and then the very last thing is, is this data thing. You know, because the whole concept a lot of networks are architected under assumes that, hey, everything behind the firewall, that's, that's all well and good. Well, it's really not the reality today. You got users bringing in devices that you don't know about connected to your network and doing all kinds of things that you don't necessarily want done or having those devices ha have access to your data. So really, you need to kind of refocus uh, your efforts on re-architecting your network and kind of this, this onion where you might have you know, all, all of your client devices in this ring. The next ring might be you know, like Citrix servers or uh, application servers. You know, the next ring might be uh, really sensitive devices um, that need a little extra protection between each layer would be a firewall, and at the very center would be your actual data. You know, and really, you would have to design a, a network around the whole concept that no client is to be trusted. You know, clients should never have a direct path to servers that actually have data on them. Then this whole BYOD, consumerized, bring whatever device in you want, becomes a lot less intimidating and frightening because they're way out here. And you have a lot of controls to get all the way into here. <clears throat> you know, data on any device should be encrypted in flight. Um, clients uh, should be encrypted. I mean, BitLocker comes with Windows. Uh, PointSec has a TrueCrypt. There's all kinds of, of utilities you can use to, to encrypt, hold this of corporate devices. Um, native encryption should be enabled on smartphones. You know, you should probably use advanced pins. I mean, a lot of this is just sitting down with the user and saying, hey, this is why you should use it, and not coming with the hammer and saying, look, I'm gonna install this MDM agent, you're gonna do it, and this is how we're gonna do it. We have to get out of this role of being the cop and, and put more accountability on the user. You know, clients and servers should have their local OS firewall on. There's a lot of environments that I've seen that don't, you know, the clients themselves don't have a firewall. Servers don't have a firewall, certainly, because they think they're sitting behind a firewall, they're safe. Well, every uh, server and client really is, should be an island that has strict ACLs. Um, and you should educate users on the whole removable storage ideal. Um, you know, I showed you box scripter, but I mean, there's BitLocker to go for like USB thumb drives and, and DVDs and things like that. I mean, these are good things to sit down with the user and actually show them how to use this stuff and when, under what situations they should use it. In Office uh, 2013, um, there's a really nice feature that's built in, and I only have a screenshot of it, and it's not a very good one. I apologize. Okay, well, I apologize, I can't find it. But basically what it does is as you're typing 
or you're going to send a, an Outlook message, for example, it actually will look inside the message and the attachments, and it will look for stuff and say, oh, he have a social security number in it. You might not want to send that. Um, tips is what they call it. And it's in a lot of their products, like um, Word and Excel in, in 2013. So, I mean, that's going to give the user kind of the cue to know when to encrypt and maybe when not to worry about it so much. But, um, that's all I have. Uh, I'll take any questions. I'm not sure how much time we have left, if any. <laughs> Right. So what was the question? I just seen this more like the whole BYO movement now is no longer PC, but mobile. It's not just PCs and Macs. Well, no, you're right. So, I mean, virtualization, there doesn't seem to be a lot of options for virtualization for like an iPad to be able to do something like that, for example. At least not yet. So. Question back there. Right. No, you know, it, my, my reaction to those devices was the same because I'm like, well, what can you do with this thing? But it's amazing the things that you're starting to see people do with it because now that the applications are starting to mature, I mean, you're actually seeing people use it for real work. And I think it's, it's early. I mean, I think that's just picking up. I mean, a lot of people have these devices and they're kind of like, well, now what do I do with them? But, you know, schools, they, they latched onto them. They found out, hey, you know, I can move all my all my books, instead of having a kid carry a backpack full of textbooks and incurring those costs, I can digitally update these books and give it to them, and you know, that's, that works for them. Um, you know, the whole typing interface versus touch, I mean, you see a lot of people with iPads that have Bluetooth keyboards, for example. I mean, to me, it's kind of like, why don't I just bring an Ultrabook instead? I mean, it, it weighs about the same but I have a keyboard and, and everything else. But, you know, it's really... <laughs> but, you know, I, two years ago I was using a Blackberry. Now I'm using an iPhone. And, you know, I use it a lot. Now, does it do everything? Does it replace my PC? I don't see those devices replacing PCs. Not anytime soon. Not for certain use cases, anyway. younger folks are going to figure out ways to still manipulate that data and it not be so clumsy like an old spreadsheet used to be. Right. So we have to look at that. The interface could change. And then now these devices are, are more valuable because they do, you know, something a lot easier. I, it's just, to me, it's not there yet, but, you know, they want these devices to do certain things and it's a lot, a lot of it's just use case driven. And some of it's just gadget driven, you know, I just want to have it. But, I, th I think it's actually getting um, compressed from both angles. I mean, our CEO, most of our C-level people, they use iPads. I mean, 
not as their sole device, but they use them. And you know, we have new people coming in. You know, I can walk through our call center and I can see people, they got iPads laying off the side because they go on break, they start reading books. You know, they got a Kindle or whatever. Um, I see it from both angles. I mean, it, it really is guys like me that have been there for 25 years are the guys in the middle of all this. You know, we don't understand what's going on, but you know, that's what they want. I'm personally, I'm worried about data. I'm not worried about, you want to use whatever device you want to use to do your work, you know, Godspeed. But, you know, if I can't keep my data secure, that's really the IT mission to me. What would be your approach to communicating to your organization that is not, that you're not adopting or accepting the new technology, but the effect it has on infrastructure from a bandwidth perspective? Like how much bandwidth these devices use? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, if you accept uh, that you're going to build all these hosted applications and. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can't say no <laughs> because that's what they want. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I got a friend that's, uh, he's an administrator, uh, over 2,100 uh, nodes in uh, a public school district in Michigan. He, they have gotten rid of every one of their PCs they use for students. That's 2,100 people. They all have iPads. So their network had to be completely pulled out, gutted, because of what they had set up was all around you know, Windows desktops. Well, now it's all about wireless iPads. So I mean, it required a totally different infrastructure. But that's what they wanted. And you know, a lot of this stuff is not driven by IT. It's driven by users and, and by management. And you, know, you have to be honest about the costs these incur. But you know, a lot of it's not about cost. It's what they want to give their employees you know, or students if you're a school.